Insects are the mosquito carries malaria from man to man. Springs. spreads plague from rats to men. From the common fly comes typhoid and dysentery. Today, man wages a constant battle against the insect. But 70 years ago, no one realized the danger from the insect. In Germany, a young student of chemistry, Ottmar Zeidler, produced a new chemical substance. He had, in fact, discovered an insect killer, but neither he nor his superiors saw its possibilities. At that time, no one knew that insects carry disease. Zeidler was satisfied with making a note of his discovery and giving it the technical name of dichlor diphenyl trichloroethane. Zeidler made his discovery during the Franco-Prussian War, when half the German army went down with dysentery. Death by disease follows in the trail of war. Insects bring disease, and disease brings death. Scientists know that the best way to prevent these diseases is to destroy the insects that carry them. So for years, the scientists studied their habits and strove to find the perfect weapon which would destroy them. Some insecticides were found, but none was the complete answer to the problem. With the coming of World War II, the search for a weapon against insects became the army's problem. In order to fight these diseases that are carried to man by insects, we need two things. First, since prevention is better than cure, insecticides to destroy the insects themselves. Secondly, drugs to cure the diseases. When war broke out, we had both these things. But when Japan came in, the situation altered. Have a look at this map. You see the danger we were facing. The Japs occupied all this area here. Pyrethrum, our best insect killer, came from Japan itself. Here, Geris root, another insect killer, came from Malaya and from the Dutch East Indies. Quinine, the drug that cures malaria, comes from Java. But we were able to replace this with a better drug, Atabrin. But there was nothing to replace the insecticides we'd lost. The outlook was grim. Look where we were fighting. In North Africa, where you get dysentery and typhus. In Sicily and Italy, malaria in the summer, typhus in the winter. And above all, in Burma, a hotbed of malaria. Well. That was our position. Our troops were fighting in the insect danger areas, and we'd not got the weapons to destroy the insects. Then we heard of DDT, the insecticide that Othmar Zeidler discarded over 72 years ago. It was being manufactured in Switzerland. It had stopped a potato beetle plague. We got samples, sent them to America, and to our own experts. We were not sure that DDT was the answer to our problems, but it was worth trying. And so it was tried. In laboratories and research stations in this country, scientists turned their attention to this long neglected chemical, which we now call DDT. We started experiments on the louse. The research worker must keep the lice alive, so we feed them on our own blood. The lice are kept in capsules, and can feed on the skin through a thin gauze cover. The lice were placed on cloth that had been impregnated with DDT. The results of the preliminary tests were very encouraging. The nervous system of the louse was paralyzed. Within 24 hours, all the lice were dead. At another research station, we carried out experiments on flies. Some 200 flies were put in a cabinet and a liquid spray was used against them. The mixture in the spray included pyrethrum and DDT. We found that the pyrethrum knocked the flies down and the DDT killed them. When pyrethrum alone had been used, some of the knocked out flies recovered. But with DDT, the spray was fatal. But we didn't stay in our laboratory. We went to the slums to try out DDT against the bed bug, which undermines the health of so many human beings. 
we went into rooms which were known to be bug infested and sprayed walls, furniture and bedding. Not only did the spraying kill the pests, but one treatment kept the room completely clear of bugs for several months. Next, we tackled the army's most important problem, the mosquito, carrier of malaria. Here again, we have to keep the insects alive so that we always have a stock. In the experiments on the mosquito, cages of the insects were placed at various points and levels in a room. Then the room was sprayed with the pyrethrum DDT mixture, which had been so successfully used against flies. Just the same thing happened. The pyrethrum knocked the mosquitoes down, and within minutes, the DDT killed them. The young forms of the mosquito, the larvae, are found in water. Laboratory tests were carried out using solutions of DDT in oil and emulsions containing the chemical to find out its effect on these potential malaria carriers. We discovered DDT to be the most effective killer of larvae we had yet found. Again, the effect was slow, but sure. The larvae developed convulsions as the DDT paralyzed their nervous system, and within a few hours, they were dead. Our next stage was to carry out experiments in the field to find out the effect of DDT on the natural breeding places of the mosquitoes in this country. A stretch of water was first examined to make sure that mosquito larvae were present in large enough numbers for experiment. DDT in oil was sprayed as a thin film over the surface of the water. After 24 hours, we returned to our carefully marked stretch of water and took samples at various distances from the bank. There was not a single mosquito larva left alive in any of the dippers of water. But would a chemical so deadly to insects be dangerous to man? Rather than risk human lives, experiments were first of all done on animals. Pure DDT, 20 times stronger than the DDT in normal use, was applied in powder form to the skin of various animals. Other animals were fed by tube with various measured quantities of the chemical. A period of observation followed. No ill effects were found unless large quantities in oil solution were allowed to come in contact with the skin. Sections, so finely cut as to be transparent, were taken from the liver, brain, and other vital organs of the animals experimented on. These specimens were chemically treated and mounted on glass slides ready for the microscope. Under the microscope, the specimens were carefully examined by an expert who searched for any damage that might have been caused by DDT. The experiments showed conclusively that we would be safe to proceed with the final test on human beings. Men of the RAMC volunteered for this experiment. Half of them were issued with shirts impregnated with DDT. The others had ordinary shirts, but there was nothing to indicate which was which. They had to keep their shirts on all the time. For one month, they worked and slept with DDT next to skin, and only removed the shirts for medical examination. They couldn't wash any part of the body that came in contact with the shirt. Their blood was tested to ensure that DDT caused no damage to the vital cell. One unexpected parade of the day was free beer, but it was part of the experiment. The results of sweating it out were observed just as carefully. Our experiment was a success. At the end of the month, the men who had worn DDT shirts were just as fit as the men who had worn ordinary ones. Shirts impregnated with DDT were perfectly safe to wear. At once it was decided to go into production on a large scale. At a secret factory somewhere in Britain, work was started to find the easiest method of making DDT. Research workers had to solve the problem of producing the chemical in the enormous quantities now required. Already the schedule for 1945 had gone through, and the factories in Britain were to be asked to produce 7,000 tons of DDT in that year. Many processes were tried in the laboratory before the chemist was satisfied, but at last a satisfactory model was made, and from it a large-scale plant was built.
DDT finally emerges as a granular white powder, which goes to other factories to be made up in the forms in which it will be used to destroy the insect enemies of the sodium. To fight the louse, we have AL63, marks three and four, in which the DDT is mixed with talcum powder. To deal with the mosquito and the fly, DDT is mixed with oil and turned out in five-gallon drums, ready for shipment to the theatres of war where it is most needed. While workers were mixing DDT with powder and oil, others were impregnating shirts with the chemical. The process is similar to ordinary dry cleaning, except that DDT is added. 85,000 shirts a week were being turned out for D-Day by this factory alone. Every shirt contained at least 1% of its weight of DDT. In spite of air raids, enough impregnated shirts were turned out to give two to every invasion soldier. The world waited and the men waited. They were confident men because they had everything that a modern army needs. They had the weapons, the supplies, and the ships. They had also DDT, though probably few realized its importance. D-Day came. Our men fought their way through Western Europe surrounded by the destruction and filth that are the hallmarks of war and the paradise of vermin. But they were protected by their special shirts and their anti louse powder. Some of them may have remembered the last war, when almost every man was lousy within a few weeks. But this time it was different. Less than one man in a thousand was infested with lice. DDT was winning a secret battle for them. The field hygiene section of every division was now equipped with special apparatus to spray DDT where it was most needed. There was no need to have an infested billet in occupied territory now. DDT solution was sprayed on the walls to destroy bugs. DDT powder got rid of the fleas and lice that infested bedding and floors and might have brought trench fever and typhus. Cookhouses were kept free of flies by spray. Enough DDT was deposited on the walls of a kitchen to kill any flies alighting on them for many weeks afterwards. In a closed room, respirators must be worn for this job. Breeding places of the flies were sought out and sprayed with DDT. Young flies emerging from the grub stage were killed by the thousands. Besides the field hygiene sections, there were mobile laundries, which re-impregnated shirts with DDT after six weeks' wear. Although a German invented DDT, the Germans in France had none, and they suffered by it. Prisoners streamed into our cages, crawling with lice. For every one British soldier infected, there were 8,000 lousy Germans. To prevent an outbreak of disease that might spread to our own troops, prisoners of war were disinfested as they came in. AL-63 powder was blown between the layers of their clothing and between clothing and skin. By this method, clothes and men were treated at the same time, and thousands could be dealt with in a day. Just for safety's sake, the British guards were disinfested too, in case they'd caught anything from their captive. Back in Britain, work was proceeding on other methods of spraying DDT. Methods that would be needed in a theater of war where the insect is an even greater menace, the Far East. Soda water sparklet bulbs were adapted to contain insect-killing substances, including DDT, and a gas under pressure to expel the spray when the valve was broken. So the sparklet bulb became an individual insecticide spray. The sparklets were weighed to make sure they contained enough solution. Samples of each batch that left the factory were tested. The most spectacular method and the biggest advance of all was the use of high-speed aircraft to spray DDT over wide areas of country. The tests were carried out in Britain, first of all. Aircraft were fitted with special tanks which contained an oil solution of DDT.
the aircraft released the spray over a prepared area of ground. In this area, cards were placed so that the size and distribution of the drops as they reached the ground could be measured. At the same time, cages containing adult mosquitoes and jars containing mosquito larvae were exposed to the spray. Both the mosquitoes and the larvae were killed by the spray from the aircraft. But trials took place not only in Britain. Out in the Far East, similar tests were carried out by Southeast Asia Command. They had to discover whether aircraft spray could penetrate the dense jungle. The mosquito breeds wherever there is water. Would our spray reach these breeding places? The tests were successful. Soon a technique was perfected. Now, before our men occupy an insect-ridden area, aircraft render it insect-free by spraying even while the enemy is still in occupation. Close behind our advancing forces come the malaria control unit whose job is to clear up any remaining breeding places of the mosquito. They not only kill the larvae, but seek out the hiding place of the fully grown mosquito. But you can't carry out this kind of control in the front line. It's up to the individual soldier then. You can make even a Japanese foxhole free of dangerous insects by using your individual insecticide sprayer. This is why the sparklet was devised back in Britain and spraying tests at home had made it possible for our troops in the Far East to keep their sleeping quarters permanently free of insects. War is a great calamity, but out of it can come discoveries that will profit the whole world long after the fighting is done. Penicillin has already saved countless lives on the battlefield. DDT ranks with penicillin in its importance, not only now, but in the peace that lies ahead. Already the civilian population of at least one great city has felt its effect, Naples, a city wrecked by the retreating Germans. Winter supplies of coal had been burnt, reservoirs had been dynamited, the gas, electricity and water supplies were blown up and destroyed, the Neapolitans were living amid the devastation and filth bequeathed them by the Nazis. Lack of food meant weaker resistance. Conditions were ideal for the spread of lice and an epidemic of typhus fever. They were without light, without heating, and almost the only water they could get was from the sewers. The typhus epidemic started. It started as epidemics do in a small way. Isolated cases began to come into the hospitals of Naples. But by October 1943, some 25 cases a day were being admitted. By the end of November, the daily admission rate had risen to 40, and the death rate was rising too. The situation caused grave concern to those responsible for the health of our troops in the Naples area. The increase continued by leaps and bounds during December, and it was anticipated that before the epidemic could be controlled, there would be a quarter of a million dead, dead from typhus, dead from lice. One out of every three struck down by typhus will die. In January 1944, DDT was brought to Naples by the American Typhus Commission in the hope that it would save the situation. The population of Naples flocked to the 43 d lousing stations that had been set up in the city, and there they were treated with DDT powder by some of their own fellow countrymen. Those who could not come to the dusting centers were treated in their homes. By the end of January, well over a million Neapolitans, from the oldest to the youngest, had been disinfested. 
By the middle of February, the emergency was over. Typhus was on the way. And for the first time in medical history, an epidemic of this disease had been effectively checked. The battle is not over. Back in the laboratories, the work is going on. Quietly, patiently, thoroughly. Today, scientists are thinking of the post-war world. Can DDT be used in the walls and the paintwork of our houses so that they may be free of the pests that still infest so many parts of the country? Can we find some method of using DDT to destroy the insects that cause the total loss of one-tenth of the world's foodstuffs every year? The ravages of famine and plague may be prevented by DDT. DDT may save the fields of crops blighted by insects. DDT may rid the country of breeding places of disease like these. If we use it for the good of all, DDT may help to build a better world. A world fit not only for heroes to live in, but for ordinary people.